Prologue Heather McLean looked at her sister Jessica as she got to the house where she'd grown up. Do you have any idea why Dad called us here? she asked. Her dad was always calling family meetings, usually so he could show off his newest tech gadget, but this time he hadn't said why they were all expected to be there. But as usual, he'd ordered, and his girls had obeyed. No idea. He's being closed-mouthed about this. Hopefully, he doesn't just want to show us his newest game he's programmed for the Atari. I mean, I love video games as much as the next girl, but I don't need to see another golf simulator and be expected to get excited over it. Jessica was the second sister in the family of seven McLean daughters. I guess we're about to find out. Heather was the eldest, and she had a little house she loved right in the middle of Bagley, Texas. She had planned to spend the night curled up in front of the television watching The Love Boat and Fantasy Island. Saturday nights were the only nights when she took time away from her busy life to vegetate in front of the TV, and she hated that she'd been stopped. Thankfully she'd just gotten a VCR, and she could tape the shows and watch them later. Who knew how long her father would keep them there? How was aerobics this morning? Jessica asked, looking at her sister out of the side of her eye. Ugh. I swear every woman in the world should not don a leotard simply because it's an aerobics class. Shorts and a t-shirt work just as well. You wear a leotard for aerobics class. I'm the teacher. It's what I wear when I teach their darling daughters and granddaughters how to dance every day. Why shouldn't I wear one? Why shouldn't they? Jessica shot back with a grin. Heather sighed. Sometimes talking to her sister was like talking to a brick wall. I'm taping the love boat and Fantasy Island if you want to come over and watch them after whatever dad has planned for us. She enjoyed watching the shows alone, but she knew her sister hadn't yet invested in a VCR. Ooh. Count me in. I can't believe dad chose a Saturday night. Last time we told him he could never interrupt our Saturday night shows again. We'll live. Heather opened the front door and walked inside without knocking, knowing her mother expected it. Mom. We're here. Her mother emerged from the kitchen, a grin on her face. I was just microwaving some supper. I love how fast my new gadget works. That's the next thing I'm buying myself, Heather said. I want a microwave. The new ones aren't nearly as expensive as the radar ranges were in the 70s. I'm glad you're an 80s lady, Mom. Heather kissed her mother on the cheek. Why exactly are we here? Her mother sighed. You know your father. He has some new gadgets you all need to see as soon as possible. Oh, yay! Is Marty here? Marty, the youngest sister, went to school in Austin and she rarely made it home on weekends. She is. Your father said all seven of you needed to be here tonight. Mom led them into their father's study, where all of the sisters were waiting for the miraculous unveiling of something. Heather went straight to her father, Robert McLean, and kissed his cheek. Hey, Dad. What is so important? She knew he wouldn't answer, but she also knew he loved to be able to hide his secrets. She was showing her love by letting him hide whatever he was doing. I can't say until everyone is here. Dad said, his eyes still glued to his brand new Macintosh. Heather looked around her, quickly counting heads. She wanted to make it for her shows if at all possible. She had 15 minutes. Maybe they'd all pile on the couch in the living room and watch. She touched her own chest mouthing the names of her sisters as she went through them all. Heather, Jessica, Galen, Rebecca, Tracy, Candace, Marty. She shook her head. We are all here, Dad. All seven of us, and we're dying to see whatever it is that you want to show us. Dad grinned but shook his head. We're doing this my way. You can watch your shows when they repeat. He looked around at all seven of his daughters, a look of pride on his face. 
I have two new gadgets to show you, and there's another I'll be getting just as soon as it's available. Heather and Jessica exchanged a look. They'd been right, but it was no surprise to either of them. Okay, Dad, I'll bite. What are the new gadgets? Heather glanced at her watch, saying a quick prayer that he would hurry, but she knew as well as her sisters did that it was not going to work. Not until I want to tell you. First, I'm going to tell you about what I don't have yet, but I will soon. He leaned back in his office chair, a huge grin on his face. He loved when all of his daughters were surrounding him. How could he not feel pride when they were all so beautiful and smart? You know back in September, a plane was shot down in Soviet airspace, but it was an accident. You see, the Korean plane had never intended to fly into the USSR. They just went off course. Well, the US military has had a technology called Global Positioning Systems for years, and they've just opened it up for non-military use. Can you imagine what it would be like if we could just look at a gadget and know where we are? No man would ever have to stop and ask for directions again. Like any man does. Heather responded. Robert glared at his eldest daughter. I asked for directions when we got lost on the way to Yellowstone. Remember? Dad, that was in 1972. More than ten years ago. He shrugged. I keep a map in the car. He shook his head. Stop trying to distract me, Heather. This gadget is going to change our world. I've already invested in a company who is working on the first handheld device. I can't wait. Me neither, Jessica said, her face full of enthusiasm. Heather had always been impressed by Jessica's acting skills. So, the second gadget is even more exciting. With as much as you girls love telephones, I'm sure you're going to be super excited by this. He held up an object that barely resembled a telephone. It was white, looked solidly made, and had an antenna sticking out of it. I paid a pretty penny for this beauty, but it's a cell phone. I can make calls from my car with this thing. Heather looked at her sisters, surprised. That's pretty cool. I know. Let me show you how it works. He punched buttons on the phone, and the house phone rang. Their mother answered. Hello? I'm talking to you from a cellular phone. That's really nice, Bob. I want to try. Marty said, reaching for the phone. No way. Bob put the phone behind his back to hide it from his phone-hungry youngest child. It's a buck for every two minutes you talk on it. Marty immediately backed away. I'm a college student. That's my food budget for a week. Everyone laughed, knowing she was exaggerating. You should come to my place to eat after this, Heather offered. Marty shook her head. Nope. I'm staying here because Mom promised to do my laundry. Heather looked at her mother. You always spoil her. I was doing my own laundry at ten. And I can do my own laundry. Marty protested. But I came home for the weekend, and Mom said she would do it. Heather rolled her eyes, but didn't say anything else. What was the point? Marty would always be the spoiled sister. When Jessica looked at Heather, she could read her sister's mind. They'd always thought the youngest sisters had it too easy. The next thing their dad did had them all gawking. He pushed a few buttons on his computer, and they could hear the sounds of dialing. What are you doing, Dad? Galen, the third sister, asked. That sounds like a phone call. How are you doing that? I'm doing something that is going to change our world. I'm calling into a computer system that will allow me to talk to other people online. Soon, there will be no real mail. It will all be computer mail. Heather shook her head. I don't believe it. People will never give up writing letters to each other for typing things on a computer. It just won't happen. You mark my words, Heather. 
In another 20 years, people are going to be paying their bills online. I bet they will rarely talk to each other, because computers will be the favored way to communicate. Our world is changing, and that's all there is to it. Heather looked at Jessica, and she knew her sister was thinking the same thing she was. Okay, Dad. Whatever. As soon as the words left her mouth, there was a loud clap, sounding like thunder, and the lights went out. Their mother sighed. It looks like all your gadgets blew a fuse, Bob. I'll go check the breaker. She picked up a flashlight they kept on the desk in his office, knowing he would need it. He was constantly making their power go out. Heather stood there for a moment, feeling tingling throughout her body. Does anyone else feel as if they got a little of the power that just went out? Like flung into their bodies? Were you electrocuted, Heather? Are you all right? Bob sounded very concerned. I think I'm fine. It wasn't so much an electrocution as it was a power surge. She wanted to say that it had the same feeling as when she'd gotten her first kiss, but she knew her dad would not approve. As far as he was concerned, she was 32 years old and had never been kissed. She wasn't going to disillusion him. It was then that the lights came back on, and Heather saw that each of her sisters looked as shell-shocked as she felt. Maybe she would wait to watch her shows. I'm not feeling great. I think I'll go home. It was then she noticed that her father had a reddish hue to his skin. It had never been there. When mom walked back into the room, she had a blue hue. As soon as she walked close to their father, both of their hues blended beautifully, causing them to both look a bit violet. How odd. Her mother hugged her. Yes, go home. Heather looked over at Jessica. Come over tomorrow night. I'm not up for watching TV tonight. Jessica nodded, looking a bit ill herself. I'll be there around seven or so. Sounds good. Heather headed for the door, wondering what was going on. She was miserable all of a sudden. A hot bath and her bed were all she needed. Chapter 1 Heather finished her third class of the day and quickly mopped her face with a towel. The little ones were keeping her jumping. Mrs. Jackson walked over, and Heather wished there was a place to hide. I think that little Susie should be playing the part of the sugar plum fairy. She's the best dancer in the class, and you know it as well as I do. Heather bit back a groan. I've assigned the parts as I felt they needed to be assigned. I'm sorry if you're not pleased. The truth was, little Susie Jackson was the worst dancer in her four-year-old class. She danced into walls and fell on her but more often than all the other girls in the class put together. And with a class of four-year-olds, that was truly saying something. There's a dance studio opening up in nowhere. I'm sure the teacher there would recognize my daughter's talent for exactly what it is. I'm sure she would. If you feel led to take Susie there, I will understand. Maybe I'm just not the right teacher for her. Heather did her best to keep her face even. She knew that the true problem was that Susie had absolutely no natural talent and would be better off swinging a softball bat, but she couldn't say that to Mrs. Jackson. Mrs. Jackson looked shocked. She was from one of the wealthiest families in Bagley. Of course, Heather was from the wealthiest family in Bagley. Her uncle ran a boys' ranch outside town, and they had always funded the place with their own money though people in town rarely realized that. She'd be attending the annual fundraiser on Saturday afternoon. She'd cancelled all her classes and everything. If you don't want my business, then that's just what I'll do. Heather refused to back down. She'd known Angela Jackson since she was Angela Simpson and eating her boogers in kindergarten. I'll miss you, Susie. Maybe we'll see each other around town though. She leaned down and hugged the little girl, who clung to her. I hope you like your new teacher. Susie's eyes filled with tears. I like your class, Miss Heather. I like having you in my class, 
But if your mama wants you to go to the new school in nowhere, I can't stop that from happening. Heather glanced at the clock on her wall. I have exactly 45 minutes to eat lunch before my next class is due. She turned and walked toward her kitchen, knowing it would infuriate Angela, but not really caring. She'd never been the other woman's fan anyway. Come along, Susie. The door of the dance studio opened and slammed shut. Heather sighed. She walked into the kitchen and looked in the fridge. There was her grilled chicken salad she'd made for lunch. It had sounded great that morning, but now all she wanted was a taco. Tacos were her comfort food, and she was going to have one. There was a small mom and pop place around the corner with the best tacos in Bagley. Maybe the best tacos in all of Texas. She shrugged her coat on over her leotard and hurried out the door. She didn't usually run around in just her leotard and tights, but she had no time to change if she wanted her tacos, and man did she want her tacos. As she hurried, she watched people's hues. For the past seven months, every time she went out in public, she saw the hues of people. She could tell the people who were meant to be together by how their hues blended as they walked toward one another. In front of her, for instance, were two perfectly good people, but when they were together, their hues turned black. It was all Heather could do not to tell them to stay far away from each other. She could see that the woman was pregnant, and she knew the fates would not be good to them. Black was always bad when it came to hues blending. In front of the taco stand was a man with a hue like no other. The color hovering over him was a pure sky blue. She was drawn to it in a way she'd never been drawn to another. She didn't talk to him, though, because she had no time. As much as she wanted to get to know him, she knew he wasn't a local. She knew everyone who lived there in Bagley. Why would she want to start a relationship with a man who wasn't a local? She stood behind him in line, and when he moved out of the way, she placed her order. Two tacos and a bean and meat burrito. And a Dr. Pepper. She knew she shouldn't have the sugar because she had to teach another three classes that afternoon and two that evening, but it couldn't matter to her. She needed that Dr. Pepper after her run-in with Angela. The woman had been a thorn in her side ever since kindergarten. When she was handed her food, she turned around to see the man staring at her. He looked as flummoxed by her as she felt by him. I'm Michael Muir, he said quietly, taking off his cowboy hat and tipping it to her. Heather McLean, but more importantly, I'm late. Gripping her bag of Tex-Mex fabulousness in one hand and her Dr. Pepper in the other, she hurried toward the dance studio. What are you doing tonight? Michael asked, obviously hurrying to keep up with her. Teaching dance. It's what I do every night. What about Saturday? Do you teach dance on Saturdays? The man sounded slightly panicked as he tried to pin down a time he could see her again. Usually, but this Saturday, I'll be at the McLean Boys Ranch. There's a huge fundraiser. May I escort you? He stood outside the dance studio, obviously not wanting to go inside. Her eyes met his, and she looked away for a moment, catching their reflections together in the plate glass window of her dance studio. His sky blue blended beautifully with her pink. The color was a shade of lavender that had always been a favorite of hers. It was even the color of the leg warmers she was wearing. Meet me here at noon. You can drive me out there, and we'll spend the day together. He grinned, tipping his hat. I'll see you then, Heather McLean. And I'll see you, Michael Muir. She hurried inside and shut the door in his face. Five minutes to eat. She was going to be miserable all day, either from eating too fast or not eating. She chose tacos over starvation and shoveled the food in quickly. She had just finished the last bite of her burrito when the bell over the door tinkled, letting her know that the first of her afternoon students had arrived. She turned with a smile on her face and shrugged out of her coat. It was time for tap. She preferred ballet, but tap was fun as well. 
Her mind was not on the children that afternoon, though. How could it be? Her brain was full of Michael Muir and only Michael Muir. Asterisk. Michael met with Jonathan McLean, following the man into the fields. Are you any relation to Heather? He asked, knowing it was probably a mistake. He was there to buy cattle from Jonathan, not to pick up women. She's my niece. Best dancer in the area. She was a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader for a few years, but she didn't like how the women were treated as sex symbols. Said she was above that. Why? Michael smiled. He could just picture Heather in a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader uniform, and he liked that picture. A lot. Maybe he could get a hold of one of the old posters she would have been on. I met her in line for tacos a little while ago. Ah. She must have taken a quick lunch. She usually eats in the studio. She said she was in a hurry. Michael tried to concentrate on the cattle he was there to buy, but he could only think of the beautiful niece of the man he was talking to. Jonathan pointed out the bull he thought the other man would be interested in. This guy is pure Angus. He'd be perfect for the crossbreeding program you told me about. Michael looked at the bull, which had been taken to a small corral on his own. There were two other bulls trapped similarly for his inspection. Clean bills of health on all three of them? Yup. These are the best I have. There are a couple of younger ones I'll use for my herd, but these are ready to go out and multiply other people's herds. Michael looked around him. You sure do have a whole lot of houses on your ranch. He wondered if this was the place Heather had told him about. The McLean Boys Ranch. He knew he was dealing with a McLean, but how many McLeans were there in the area? Yeah, those are the houses for the boys. I have seven sons, and those houses are for the foster sons on the ranch here. We keep about thirty at all times. That's really cool. I've never heard of a boy's ranch. We were certainly the first in the area. My grandfather started the boy's ranch part of the operation with his wife, back in the early part of the 20th century. Before World War I. There was a boy's orphanage in town, and when it burned down, my grandmother said she was taking all the boys in. So they set themselves up to raise them. Here we are seventy-some years later and the ranch is still raising boys at the same rate it raises cattle. Jonathan sounded blasé about the whole situation, but it was obvious he was proud of his heritage. That's interesting. And it made Michael certain he was buying his cattle from the right place. He wanted to help these people with their boys' ranch if it was at all possible. Do the boys help with the cattle? The boys help with everything. They have the same types of chores my own boys did as they were growing up. I have seven boys. Seven? That's a lot of boys. The seventh son in my family always has seven sons. Not a girl in sight. My brothers had lots of girls, but not me. Just boys. My brother Bob tried to one-up me by having seven girls, but I had my seven boys, so it didn't work. I see. Michael found himself fascinated by the family. I'm looking forward to getting to know you all better this weekend at the fundraiser. Are you coming? Jonathan asked, seeming surprised. I'm going to escort Heather. Jonathan raised an eyebrow, before nodding. Just know she has a lot of people who love her around here. Don't hurt her. We were certainly the first in the area. My grandfather started the boys' ranch part of the operation with his wife, back in the early part of the 20th century. Before World War I. There was a boys' orphanage in town, and when it burned down, my grandmother said she was taking all the boys in. So they set themselves up to raise them. Here we are seventy-some years later, and the ranch is still raising boys at the same rate it raises cattle. Jonathan sounded blasé about the whole situation, but it was obvious he was proud of his heritage. That's interesting. And it made Michael certain he was buying his cattle from the right place. 
He wanted to help these people with their boy's ranch if it was at all possible. Do the boys help with the cattle? The boys help with everything. They have the same types of chores my own boys did as they were growing up. I have seven boys. Seven? That's a lot of boys. The seventh son in my family always has seven sons. Not a girl in sight. My brothers had lots of girls, but not me. Just boys. My brother Bob tried to one-up me by having seven girls, but I had my seven boys, so it didn't work. I see. Michael found himself fascinated by the family. I'm looking forward to getting to know you all better this weekend at the fundraiser. Are you coming? Jonathan asked, seeming surprised. I'm going to escort Heather. Jonathan raised an eyebrow, before nodding. Just know she has a lot of people who love her around here. Don't hurt her. Chapter 2 Heather waited nervously in front of the dance studio on Saturday. She had taught her morning aerobics class, showered and changed, and was now ready. She'd insisted on a shower when she'd remodeled the old building to be a dance studio because she'd known she would want to shower between classes at times. Now she was thankful she'd done it. When Michael walked up to her, just before the time they'd set, his hue looked as pure as it had the first day. She'd been sure she'd imagined it. Hi, she said softly. She wanted to hug him. Heck, she wanted to kiss him and see if what she was feeling was all in her mind. Hey there. Are you ready? He looked her up and down, surprised at how good she looked in her jeans. She had looked pretty fabulous in her leotard and tights as well. She was wearing an old pair of jeans, a purple and pink plaid shirt, and a pair of cowboy boots. She nodded. This is a fundraiser my uncle does for the ranch every year. It keeps the boys in clothes and food. She couldn't tell him the full truth about the fundraiser, of course, because no one outside her family would really understand. There were strange things that happened within her family. Yeah, I bought a bull from your Uncle Jonathan the day I met you, so I know a bit about the fundraiser. Oh, I didn't realize. Yeah, that's why I'm in town. I was looking for a purebred Angus bull to help my herd. I'm trying to go lower fat and cholesterol to make my herd more marketable. I see. Heather frowned. Where do you live? Idaho. A small little town called Muir. It was named after my ancestors there. Idaho? She'd had no idea people really lived in Idaho. Well, in theory, she'd known of course, but she'd never met anyone from there. It's cold there. He laughed. That's an understatement. We already have snow on the ground, and you're running around with no coat. I wore one the other day, she said. Of course, that had just been to cover up her leotard and tights. She didn't like running around town showing off so much of her body, which explained why she had only lasted a couple of years as a cheerleader for the professional football team. You did. I liked the leg sweaters. She laughed, the sound tinkling through the air on their way to his truck. Most people just call them leg warmers. Yeah, those things. He stopped in front of a big Dodge Ram with Idaho license plates. Here we go. I hope you don't mind riding in a truck. Why would I? I'm a Texas girl. I just traded my truck in. You drove a truck? He was surprised. Heather seemed so delicate to him, he couldn't imagine her driving a truck. She laughed. I drove a Chevy Silverado until a few months ago. Four-wheel drive and four on the floor. He grinned. Not many girls can drive a stick these days. I feel like it's a lost skill. My daddy made me learn to drive with a stick. He said there was no point in doing things halfway. She vaulted into the truck with no problem, and he was surprised by her ease. Sure, she was obviously athletic but she was so petite he felt like he should tuck her in his pocket and carry her everywhere. 
your daddy has a point. He got in beside her and started the truck, shifting into first gear. Tell me about this thing we're doing. Oh, you'll love it. It's like an old town carnival. There's always a tilt-a-whirl and Ferris wheel. We can get hot dogs and cotton candy. It's just fun. The boys love to do it, and my aunt just loves to help organize the thing. They've been doing it since before I was born. When they got to the ranch, he was surprised at the sheer number of people who knew her. How do you know, so many people? Well, I've lived in Bagley most of my life. I left for a few years so I could try to do some professional dancing in Dallas, and I was a cheerleader there for a bit. She brushed her long blonde hair out of her face. But half the town is my family. It's ridiculous how many McLeans are here, but the family tends to have lots of kids. I'm the oldest of seven girls. I come from a big family myself. Super tight-knit. Us, too. She just wished he didn't live in Idaho. A rancher would never dream of relocating. She glanced at him again, surprised again at the pureness of his hue. She wanted to sink into him and watch their hues mix in a mirror, but her daddy would have a fit. She took his hand and led him over to where her mother was painting faces. Mom, this is Michael. He's visiting here from Idaho. Hello, Michael. Do you want me to paint a fairy on your cheek? Her mother asked, a twinkle in her eye. You know, I think I'm good. Thank you, Mrs. McLean. Heather noticed her dad walking toward them, and for a moment, she looked for a place to hide, but then she realized that Michael could handle her father. If not, there was no point in even seeing him for the short time he was in Texas. How long are you in Texas? she asked, surprised she didn't already know. She wanted the answer to be forever, but she knew it wasn't. He shrugged. I was planning to leave yesterday, but I think I need to stay a little longer now. Who's taking care of your ranch? she asked, surprised. My brothers are taking turns, giving my hands their orders. They'll hold things together until I make it home. Heather looked up as her father descended on them, his hand out to shake Michael's. My brother told me you were in town. I'm Bob McLean. Michael smiled. I'm Michael Muir. It's good to meet you. Bob looked into his eyes for a moment, studying the man in front of him. I hear you're a rancher. I am. I have a modest ranch up in Idaho. Idaho? You're not thinking of trying to lure my baby out of Texas, are you? Heather laughed. This is our first date, Dad. No luring is happening. Besides, I'm a Texas girl through and through. I couldn't imagine living anywhere else, let alone Idaho. The way she said the state name made it sound like it was a foreign country where people were known to torture their children and kick puppies. Idaho's not such a bad place, Michael protested. Already he couldn't imagine leaving Heather in Texas, but there was no way he could move there. He loved his home in a small valley in Idaho, where the mountains completely surrounded them. It might be over an hour to the nearest Walmart, but it was home. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying it's not a place I've ever been, or ever thought about going really. Do people visit Idaho? By choice? He made a face at her. I think it's a pretty wonderful place. I live in a beautiful valley there. So does that make your sister's valley girls? Not in the way you mean, he shook his head. Texans sure think their state is better than every other state, don't they? She giggled softly. We don't think, we know. Glancing over her shoulder, she saw her cousin Peter headed toward her with his fiancée, Lillian. They were about to get married and have seven more boys. Peter was the youngest, and everyone knew his fate. Hey, Peter. This is Michael. Hi, Michael. I heard you just bought one of our bulls. Peter was in his mid-twenties, and there was a twinkle in his eye that made Michael wonder what the other man was up to.
I did. I'm taking him back to Idaho with me even though Heather thinks Idaho is funny. Peter grinned. That's Heather for you. Her sense of humor has always been a little bit off. I have to say, I've never met anyone from Idaho. What's life like up there? Michael shrugged. He didn't feel intimidated by the man because he was holding the hand of a young woman. The man obviously didn't have feelings for Heather. I like it. It's the most beautiful place on earth. You think? Have you seen a hill country sunrise yet? I have. Just this morning. It was pretty, but not as pretty as the sun setting over one of the mountains in my valley. Heather leaned toward Peter and Lillian. His sisters are valley girls. Lillian giggled. I don't know if you should make fun of his home, Heather. I never did have a normal sense of humor. Peter said so, and he's known me since the day he was born. I wish I could say I've changed his diapers, because that would embarrass him, but I'm not that much older than he is. Lillian shrugged. You should probably say it anyway. Torturing your cousins should be your lifelong goal. Cousin? Michael asked. Peter grinned. Yeah, you bought the bull from my dad. Ah. Uh. Are there any people here you're not related to, Heather? Oh, maybe a few. Heather looked up as Jessica came toward her with their other sister, Galen. These are my sisters, Jessica and Galen. It's nice to meet you, Michael said with a grin. He looked over at Heather, wondering if she was happy in the middle of her family reunion or if he should try to drag her away. Are you hungry? I was thinking of getting a hot dog or whatever else I can find. Oh, I bet we can do better than that. There'll be some good Texas brisket around here somewhere. What if it's Idaho brisket, he asked. She laughed. Like we'd import good beef. Texas is better than that. He shook his head. It's a good thing the rest of the country doesn't feel like you Texans do. I'd starve to death because I wouldn't be able to sell my cattle. You could just butcher them and eat them yourself, and then you wouldn't have to starve, she pointed out with a sassy grin. I could. I guess I'd be homeless then, which is worse in Idaho, because the winters are brutal. That's all right. The summers in Texas are brutal. As they walked, Heather pointed out different people she knew. One little girl ran over and hugged her just as they were about to get to the barbecue stand. Heather hugged her back and smiled. It's good to see you, Emily. Emily didn't say anything else as she ran back to her mother. One of your students? Michael asked. She nodded. I love teaching dance. The kids are so much fun. I can see that. That one sure does like you. Emily likes everyone. She just loves to dance around all the time. I think she's the most natural dancer I have in all my classes. How old is she? Six. She hates school, and she loves dancing. Heather stopped at the barbecue stand. How about you let me choose for us? I promise, you need a Texas barbecue feast before you go back to your frozen Northland. All right. That works for me. Chapter 3 Michael enjoyed sitting at one of the picnic tables with her, eating the barbecue feast she'd insisted on. The brisket was to die for, but so were the baked beans and the potato salad. Okay, Texas beef may not be better, but I have to admit that Texas barbecue is. Texas barbecue makes my heart sing, Heather said. She knew she should pretend that she ate very little but she couldn't. She was an active woman who worked out hours and hours every day as she demonstrated dances for her students. He grinned. I think I can understand that. A moment later, they were joined by a group of young women. More of my sisters. Heather introduced her sisters in age order because it was the easiest way to make sure she didn't miss any. He'd already met Jessica and Galen and that left, Rebecca, Tracy, Candace, and Marty. 
Marty's the baby. Marty made a face. I'm a baby who is going to school full time. I'm not sure exactly how babyish that is. And by school, I mean the University of Texas. Tracy wrinkled her nose. I can't believe you're a Longhorn. You should have followed in my footsteps to become an Aggie. Whatever. Heather rolled her eyes. Growing up with six sisters is absolutely ridiculous. There's never any hot water. Your favorite sweater is always being worn by someone else. Marty grinned. I didn't do laundry until I went away to college because I just borrowed my sister's clothes. Candace sighed. I wish she was kidding. Michael looked at all of the sisters, wishing the other two were there. He was a bit overwhelmed, but he wanted to compare all seven of them. It's nice to meet you all. Are you going to try to get Heather to go back to Idaho with you? Marty asked. She had never been one to mince words, and she loved to embarrass her siblings. Do you think she'd consider it? he asked. Probably not. She loves Texas. Besides, what football team does Idaho have for her to cheer for? I haven't cheered in years, Heather said with a blush. But I can't see myself leaving Texas. She looked at him, sitting there, with his perfect sky-blue hue. She belonged with him, and she knew it. But how could she go so far from her family? I want to see a picture of you in your old uniform, Michael said, leaning toward her. Do you still have it? Yes, I still have it. She shook her head, blushing a little. You know I quit the team because I didn't like being a sex symbol, right? She wondered if he'd take the hint and change the subject. Hopefully, he wasn't one of those men who was just trying to get into her pants. He didn't seem the type, but it was certainly possible. I do know, so I won't tease you about it. He took another bite of his barbecue, realizing that every one of her sisters were watching them. What's there to do for fun in the evenings? There's a dance club in town. It's not a bar and they don't serve alcohol. It's truly just a place to go to dance. Heather grinned at him. It's one of my favorite places. Do you want to go tonight? She frowned. Tonight, there's a dance here. It's how we finish up the fundraiser. All of the single McLean boys and single McLean girls get to be auctioned off for dances. Hey, you have to dance with me. I brought you here. She tilted her head to one side, studying him intently. Can you dance? He frowned. Well, I can't do anything fancy, but I can hold a girl and dance with her. I'm not the guy you want to disco with. Disco is dead. Heather leaned forward. I'll give you a chance to dance with me, but you do have to bid on my dances. Think of the boys. He sighed. I guess I need to bid on your dances. Heather reached over and covered his hand with hers. Would he try to kiss her as they danced? She was dying for that first kiss. She needed to know if the Hughes were right and he was meant to be her only true love. Though she had no idea how they could make that work. He was geographically undesirable. Only if you want to dance with me. She knew she needed to start mentally preparing herself for when he went home to Idaho, but she wasn't ready. She wasn't sure she ever would be. When it was time for the dancing to start, she stood on the stage with her sisters and their cousins. Each one of them would be auctioned off for ten dances, and the rest of the night would be their own. As she watched, Michael bid higher than anyone on her first dance. She went smoothly into his arms as if they'd planned it for years. The song was almost paradise, and she immediately rested her head on his shoulder as they swayed together to the music. He was so much taller than her five-foot nothing that she couldn't quite reach his shoulder and her head ended up on his chest. He made her feel so tiny and feminine. At the end of the first dance, he leaned down and brushed his lips across hers. That kiss felt like more to her than any she had ever felt. 
The touch of his lips against hers set her whole body on fire. She let out a little gasp and wrapped her arms around his neck, kissing him back for all she was worth. She only stopped when she felt a tap on her shoulder. She pulled away, afraid of who she would see. It was Peter. Your dad is glaring at you something fierce. I'd back away if I were you. Taking gulping breaths, she stared at Michael, wondering what on earth he'd done to her. He had made her feel as if she was in someone else's body. Peter grabbed her hand and pulled her to the stage, jumping down himself. Now that he was engaged, he didn't have to have a dance auctioned off like the other cousins did. Heather stood staring out at the group of people unseeingly, taking gulping breaths of air. How on earth was she going to be able to dance with someone else now? She'd never be able to let him go. Never. On the drive home, she was silent. It was hard to know what to say when she knew she was falling deeply in love with a man who lived over a thousand miles away. At least she thought it was over a thousand. Idaho seemed like a far-off planet. When he got into town, he asked, Where do you live? Should I take you home? It was hard to answer. She wanted to wallow in self-pity, though she wasn't a wallower. How could she be in love with a virtual stranger who wasn't even a Texan? Yes, please. I'm just around the corner. I walk to my dance studio most of the time. He followed her directions, pulling up in front of her small house. The house she had so lovingly decorated. The house that now felt so empty because he didn't live there. What was wrong with her? Do you want to come in for a drink? She didn't know where the words had come from and immediately wanted to take them back. It was their first date. She shouldn't be taking him inside. He got out of the truck and silently followed her inside. Once he'd shut the door behind him, he turned to her and asked the question that had been on her mind since their kiss. What are we going to do? Heather shook her head. I have no idea. I run a business here. And I have a ranch in Idaho. I can't really spend time away, and neither can you. He put his hands on her waist and drew her to him, his lips taking hers in a swift, deep kiss. But, we can't ignore that. No, I knew when I saw you in line at the taco hut that we were meant to be together. She buried her face against his chest, not wanting to think about saying goodbye. How much longer will you be here? I have no idea. None. I really was supposed to take my bull and leave yesterday. My brothers are wondering what my problem is, but I told them I met a girl. She laughed. And they knew then you'd never come home? Nah, I'll go home. I have to. He turned from her, running his fingers through his hair. It's Saturday night. I'm supposed to be home watching Love Boat and Fantasy Island, but here I am with some girl I barely know and all I want to do is stick her in my pocket and take her home to Idaho with me. Your pockets are big enough for me. I have muscles. She flexed one bicep and made him laugh. She did have muscles, but they were very different than the kind of muscles he had. His were from hours of hauling hay and herding the cattle. Hers were from dancing. Nice muscles. I bet you could help haul hay. Or you could dance with me. He kissed her again. We're both going to need to do some serious thinking about what we want from each other. I don't know if we can make forever a reality. But that's what I want. Her voice was barely a whisper, but he heard her. Me too. I don't think it's an option. He left quietly, closing the door behind him. She was fascinating and wonderful. How had she known they were meant for each other before they even met, though? That didn't make sense. He slowly headed to the only hotel in town, parking his truck out front. When he walked in, he went past the front desk, and after a moment of contemplation, he stopped. Do you know the McLeans? The girl at the desk grinned at him. Everyone in town knows the McLeans. 
Everyone in this part of the state knows the McLeans. They're wonderful people. He frowned. Do any of them ever move away from here? You must be the man who was dancing with Heather all night. Rumor has it you two couldn't keep your eyes off each other. He frowned. How did you know that? It's a small town. People make note of everything and talk about it. It's part of our way of life. He groaned. Lovely. Yes, I do mean Heather. What are the chances I can get her to move to Idaho with me? The girl's eyes widened for a moment before she shook her head. I don't think there's any chance at all. She's happy here. She loves her family, and she runs a business. I think you need to move here. I own a ranch in Idaho. You can't sell it and buy a ranch here? That's what it would take for the two of you to be together, I think. He sighed. I have a feeling I'm going to spend the rest of my life alone. He walked away, noting the girl's name tag read, Beth. Why couldn't he fall for the Beths of the world? No, he needed Heather's. He needed the girls who were impossible. Chapter 4 Heather fell asleep that night with her thoughts on Michael and only Michael. He was the first thing she thought of when she woke up. She wanted to find out all she could about his town in Idaho, but she couldn't imagine leaving Bagley. Her family had been there for generations, and leaving the people she loved was absolutely out of the question. She dressed quickly for church, knowing her family would worry if she didn't go, but what she really wanted to do was stay home and eat ice cream and tacos. Lots of ice cream and tacos. Her family was known for always finding their perfect match, but she wasn't sure that was going to include her. Her perfect match lived much too far away. Deep inside her, she knew that there was not another man on the planet who would be as good for her as Michael was. She ate a quick breakfast of instant oatmeal and decided to walk to church. Sunday was the only day she didn't really work out, so she always wanted to walk a few extra steps to get some sort of exercise in. She believed that her body was a temple, and she treated it as such. Well, where exercise was concerned. Food was all about sacrificing to the temple. She stepped onto her front porch and immediately spotted Michael sitting in his truck out front. He was dressed in a suit and tie and saw her as she saw him. He stepped out of his truck. Do you want a ride to church? Heather shook her head. I like to walk to church. It's my only real exercise on Sundays. Well, that and housework, but who wanted to admit to that? I'll walk with you then. He walked toward her and took her hand in his. Do you mind if I go to church with you? She sighed. In a town this size, going to church and sitting beside a girl is tantamount to announcing your engagement. I'm good with that. I'm not. I don't want people thinking I'm dropping everything and moving to Idaho, and I don't want people to think you're coming here. She took a deep breath. I'm not sure it's a good idea for us to spend so much time together when we both know it's all going to end in heartache anyway. You're not moving here, and I'm sure not moving there. Michael frowned. He couldn't imagine that he could find the girl of his dreams and just walk away, not even getting to know her. Maybe we're both wrong, and we'll get on each other's nerves within a week. Don't you think we owe it to ourselves to make the breakup earlier if we can? She laughed. You know as well as I do that's not going to happen. I do. But it was worth a try. He didn't know how to convince her to move to Idaho, but he knew he couldn't move to Texas. You know, there's no dance studio in the town I'm in. I'm sure there are closer dance teachers here. Do you have any idea how hard it's been for me to get my business off the ground? Do you think I need to be the one to move because I'm the woman? Michael bit his tongue. He wanted to tell her he thought she should move, because he had ancestral land, but he was sure she didn't want to hear that. Not at all. I just think it would be easier for you to find another building to run a business from than it would be for me to move thousands of head of cattle. 
Heather knew he had a point, but she didn't have to like it. We'll see. She stopped in front of the church and walked toward the building. She had no idea what religion he was, but at the moment, she didn't care a whole lot. As they walked in, she headed straight for her family. All of her sisters were in town for the weekend for the fundraiser, and it was always fun for them to sit together. She saw Peter and Lillian talking to Marty. Now that the fundraiser is over, I can put all my energy into planning the wedding, Lillian said softly. And into convincing Peter that it really is a good idea for me to name our seven sons after the boys from Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. I don't know why he's not just jumping at the idea. He has no taste, Heather said, jumping into the conversation. Seven Brides had always been one of her favorite movies. Some of the dance moves in that movie are epic. Lillian linked her hand through Heather's arm. See? Heather knows what she's talking about. And if I have to have seven sons, I might as well name them something fun. Peter groaned. I feel ganged up on. That's what I'm here for. Heather said with a grin. Marty laughed. Of course we're going to side with Lillian. We're welcoming her to the family. Making her one of us. What if I want to name one of my sons something else? Why would you? Lillian asked. Adam, Benjamin, Caleb, Daniel, Ephraim, Frankincense, and Gideon are the best names ever. Heather heard Michael give a choked laugh, and she turned to wink at him. Maybe if you'd be willing to compromise frankincense to Frank, Peter would agree. Peter sighed. Yes. I refuse to name my son frankincense. Michael clapped his hand on Peter's back. I have a feeling you're stuck with the other names. Of course, she's willing to have your seven children, so I think you just nod and agree. If I agree, I'm afraid she may make me sign a contract agreeing to name them those ridiculous names. Lillian pulled a sheaf of papers from her purse. I had them adjust frankincense to Frank when they wrote up the contract. You just need to sign here. She pulled a pen out as well and handed it to him. Peter looked at Heather. Can you believe this? She doesn't want a prenuptial agreement. She just wants me to sign off on what our kids will be named. Heather shrugged. She sounds smart to me. She wandered off to where her parents were standing together, hugging her mother. She wasn't sure if Michael was still acting as her shadow, but she could only assume he was. It's good to see you again, Mrs. McLean, Mr. McLean. Bob looked at Michael. Are you making an announcement by attending church with my daughter? I'm announcing my intentions for certain. She doesn't seem to agree at the moment, but I'm hoping she will. Heather didn't dare look at Michael, feeling too much frustration she was certain would show. Already her feelings for him were so strong, and yet she wasn't willing to pick up and move her entire life to Idaho for him. Have you heard what the sermon is about today? She asked her mother softly. Her mother's eyes moved from Michael and back to Heather before answering. I think it's on loving your neighbor. I always like those sermons. Heather sat down in the pew behind her parents, knowing it was reserved for her and her sisters. Michael sat beside her, frowning at her. Are you angry with me? Heather lifted her hand to run her fingers through her hair, but thought better of it. Her hairspray wouldn't hold if she did that, and who wanted flat hair? I'm confused with you. I don't know what you want from me. I've told you I'm not willing to move to Idaho, and yet you're still here, talking to me and trying to convince me to do it. I'm not trying to convince you to move to Idaho. I'm trying to convince you to give me a chance and let me spend some time with you while I'm here, so we can see if either of us will need to consider moving across the country or if we should be happy where we are. She turned to look him in the eye. I just don't think I'd ever be willing, so I feel like the two of us spending a lot of time together is just going to lead to heartache. I'm willing to give it a shot if you are. Michael held his breath while he waited for her answer. His family had always been very intuitive, 
and he knew she was the only woman who he needed by his side for the rest of his life. He'd known it from the moment he'd set eyes on her. She sighed. I guess we can spend a little time together today and see where it goes. He took her hand in his and squeezed it. Thank you. Right now, that's all I'm asking for. Thankfully, the pastor stepped up to the pulpit then and announced the first song they'd sing. As she stood beside Michael, she wondered who was watching them and their little declaration. After a moment, she decided it didn't matter and instead concentrated on singing. If someone had something to say, they could just do it. Her reputation was impeccable. By the time church was over, she was feeling comfortable with her decision to spend some time with Michael. There were plenty of things to do around town, and she liked the idea of being with him. As soon as the sermon was over, he turned to her. What are your plans for the day? I usually spend Sundays at home doing laundry and housework. I'll help then. She frowned. I figured you'd come up with something more interesting than that to do. He shrugged. All I care about is spending time with you. What we do with that time doesn't matter at all to me. Heather sighed. Well, we need to get lunch first. I can feed you for supper, but I have no idea about lunch. I usually just go to my mother's for Sunday lunch after church. Her mother turned to them. Michael, you should come to Sunday lunch. You might feel a bit overwhelmed by the sheer amount of estrogen in the room, but I would love for you to be there to get to know us all better. Heather looked at Michael, waiting for his response. On one hand, she would have liked a private meal with him, but on the other hand, she knew that the less time they spent alone together, the better it would be for her heart. Sure, I'd love to have lunch with you. Heather nodded. We both walked, so we'll head over. Bagley was small enough that walking from one end of town to the other took less than twenty minutes. All right. I'll have Marty set an extra plate. Don't tell me, she traded you setting the table today for her laundry? Her mother grinned. How'd you guess? You can't begrudge me taking care of my baby. No, I guess I can't. Heather shrugged at Michael. My youngest sister is rotten. Sounds like it. Michael couldn't help but laugh at the expression on Heather's face. She looked disgusted with the trade her mother had made with her sister. The two of them talked to people on their way out of the church. Heather found herself introducing Michael over and over. A couple of the other young women seemed to be eyeing him, but Heather didn't care. She knew he would be loyal, though how she knew it, she didn't know. None of their hues were right with his either. No, he was meant for her. That much was obvious. As they walked away from the church, she kicked at a rock. I think church went well. Mom is excited to have you come over for lunch. Your family seems really nice. Even your spoiled sister. Don't you think she's rotten? Heather asked, grinning at him. He laughed. Maybe. A little. I don't really know her. He was afraid to say anything bad about her sister. If her family was anything like his, he knew that it was okay for siblings to insult someone but not for outsiders. He would do anything to avoid making her angry. Other than stay away from her, of course. That wasn't an option. Chapter 5 When they arrived at Heather's parents' house, the others were already there, and the house was bustling with activity. Jessica was in the kitchen helping cook, and Marty was setting the table. Tracy was sitting with the newspaper, reading through everything there was. Tracy sold cars for a small car dealership in town, and she did a great job of it. She always said her dream job was to own an Irish pub in town, but Heather couldn't really see that happening. As soon as they walked in, Galen hurried over. Come and sit in the living room with me. Dad has the Cowboys game on, and I want to get to know your guy. Heather frowned. I wouldn't exactly call him mine. I would. I'm hers. 
no one else's. I'm going to convince her to marry me if it takes all week. Michael was grinning as he said it, but he was dead serious. Galen laughed. All week? You're giving it a whole lot of time there. Galen was a mental health counselor, and sometimes she made Heather nervous. She hadn't told anyone in the family about the colors she saw hovering over people's faces, but she knew her sister would think she was insane if she did. Michael shrugged. I'm an optimist. What can I say? An optimist? I'm a realist, Heather said softly. Galen laughed. You? A realist? You're more of a pie-in-the-sky optimist who believes in any dream there is out there. Why would you even think you're a realist? Oh, hush. I'm not that bad. You definitely are. You were told you couldn't ever dance after you broke your leg when you were little, and you worked every day until you could dance. You were told you could never make the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders, and what did you do? You went out there, and you made it happen. And that makes me a pie-in-the-sky optimist? I would think that would make me an achiever. Galen shrugged. That too. You should come see me this week. Something's bothering you. Heather rolled her eyes. I don't need help from you to figure out what's bothering me. I know that well. Michael looked between the sisters. What does that mean? Galen smiled sweetly. I'm a mental health counselor. I have an office in town, and Heather thinks she doesn't need someone like me in her life. That's not true at all. I need my sister. I know that with everything inside me. Heather stepped close to Galen and hugged her tightly. Galen smiled. Fine. You need me as a sister, but not as a counselor. I get it. If you change your mind and want to talk, you know where to find me. Always. Heather knew her sister had her best interests at heart. It must be obvious how she was feeling about her new relationship with Michael. Their dad was sitting there in the living room, a pad of paper in his hands. I'm sure there's a way for me to figure out who will win the Super Bowl early in the season if I can just make the right algorithm, he mumbled. If you ever get that all go figured out, I'd love to hear about it. Michael said, sitting down and pulling Heather down beside him on the couch. He wanted to put his arm around her, but he really wasn't sure how her father would feel about that. I will. If I figure it out. When I figure it out. Heather watched the television, thrilled that the cheerleaders were on. Several of her closest friends were still on the squad, and she watched them whenever she had the chance. It made her feel connected to them. As she watched, one of her friends was in the front for a fun routine that Heather had written herself. She was sad not to be there to perform with them, but she was so happy they continued it without her. Michael looked between the television and her family, watching all the sisters. They all seemed like they were in their own worlds to him. What do you do for a living, Mr. McLean? Call me Bob. I'm a video game designer. Atari. He had a silly grin on his face as he named the biggest video game company there was. Oh, really? Michael knew about Atari, of course, because everyone did, but he wasn't really a fan of video games. Have you ever thought about creating a realistic hunting game? Hunting was one of Michael's favorite activities. He was always thrilled to take his mother enough meat to last an entire winter. He was careful to use every bit of the animal, though, just as the Native Americans had. He thought it was best not to waste anything. I've messed around with it a little. I figure if someone is that into hunting, they won't be sitting around playing video games. Instead, they'll be outside enjoying themselves. Am I wrong? Michael grinned. Probably not. Well, then why should I make it? That makes no sense, now does it? I guess not. It would be something that could get me to at least try a video game. Shooting aliens is really not my thing. Bob frowned. 
I didn't work on any of the alien games. I'm more the golf guy and the bowling guy. Michael shrugged. Those are probably more fun than the alien games. Heather was thrilled when her mother stuck her head into the room to call them for lunch. She wasn't sure her dad and Michael were going to come to an agreement on anything, and she knew any arguments at the table would be stopped by her mother. Asterisk. After the meal, Heather helped wash the dishes while Marty introduced Michael to the glories of the Atari golf game. He played to appease Heather's father, but he was not a fan. Not at all. As they walked back to her house, he said, What's on our agenda for the rest of the day? She frowned. She could do most of her housework late at night, but not the laundry. She needed clean leotards to teach in that week. I need to get some laundry done. I have Love Boat and Fantasy Island taped from last night. We could watch it while I work on laundry. I'll have to pause it some. That's fine. Wow. Laundry day is exciting. He needed to do laundry as well, but he'd do his at the hotel the next day while she worked. He wasn't wasting a single moment of the time they had together. He had to convince her that the two of them together were more powerful than any job. She made a face at him. Just don't think you're going to get to fondle my panties, or my leg warmers. Got it? Yeah, sure, whatever. He grinned at her, glad she was still willing to tease with him, despite her misgivings about their future. When they got to her house, she settled him on the couch while she wandered into her bedroom to gather her laundry and get it started in the garage, where her washer and dryer were. When she walked back in, she pushed play on the VCR and then sank onto the couch beside him. This is last night's shows. I hated missing it, but I am so glad I have a VCR. She glanced over at the kitchen to see her microwave oven on the counter. She loved being an 80s woman. So many gadgets to make her life easier. He scooted a little bit toward her and slipped his arm around her. She looked at him for a moment. Thanks for not doing the yawn and stretch. It seems like your style. Smooth and sophisticated? She laughed at that. Sure. That's what I was thinking. She snuggled closer to him, her head going to rest on his shoulder as she focused on the show. She loved how many people fell in love every single week. She got up twice to deal with laundry in the middle of the shows, but when they were finally over, she looked at him. I've been working on a jigsaw puzzle, if you like them. He grinned. One of my favorite things. She stood and led the way to her kitchen table. My table is always covered with a jigsaw, so I always end up using my lap as a table. Doesn't bother me, he said, liking the way she did things. He wasn't exactly formal either. Together, they sat and worked on the puzzle, talking about random things. How old were you for your first kiss? He asked. She tilted her head to one side, pretending to have to think about it. I was 15, and it was after my first football game where I cheered on the varsity squad. It was Brian Angles, and he kissed me under the bleachers. I was sure my mom was going to see us when she picked me up, but she didn't. She looked at him. What about you? I was 16, and it was after homecoming. I kissed her on her parents' front step, and her dad came out and told me to get off his porch. Michael frowned. She was grounded for two weeks, and then we went out again, and I kissed her again. I learned to do it before pulling onto her father's land, though. She laughed softly. Wise move. What was her name? Tina Nelson. We dated for the rest of the school year, and then she moved away. Do you still think of her? He shrugged. Only when someone is asking about my first kiss. She didn't exactly rock my world. She was nice, though. And she was great about helping me with my trig homework. I was not good in trig. You dated a girl for her math abilities? Well, yeah. 
why did you date Brian? Because he was the only sophomore with a car, of course. They both laughed. Priorities were so different when you were in high school than when you were an adult. Are you going to spend time with me tomorrow night? She frowned. I have evening classes tomorrow. I have morning classes as well, but no afternoon classes. We could have lunch. You have a difficult schedule, he said with a frown. Thankfully, he wasn't working while he was in Texas, and he could accommodate her. Yup. I try to make it easy for all the moms who want their daughters in dance. Some want their kids to nap all afternoon. Some are coming right after school. I have different hours on different days. She rubbed the back of her neck. I would hate to leave my students. She knew he didn't understand, but she wished he would. Those kids and parents counted on her. I know you would. Are there no other dance schools? There's one in nowhere, which isn't terribly far, and I know the teacher. She'd be good with the kids. It would just feel weird to abandon students I've been teaching for so long. How long has your studio been open? He asked. Only three years, but many of my students have been with me since day one. I truly love what I do. I know you do. He thought about whether or not he had ever seen a dance studio in New York or any of the neighboring towns. I really think you could start a place near me. You could be happy there. I have to be here at least until early December. I have promised to do the Nutcracker with my students. She wouldn't commit to anything after that, but she couldn't even consider leaving before. Maybe you could come visit me over Christmas. My mom would love to have you stay with her, so there are no strings. Just a visit. She frowned. I've never been away from my family for Christmas. I guess I can think about it, but I have a feeling I'll want to be here. He nodded. I can understand that. I do want to show you Idaho, so you can see that it's not as horrible as it is in your head. Maybe after the play. I could come in mid-December. He really hoped they'd be engaged by then, but he was willing to wait for her. Whatever it took. Whenever is good for you. The cattle and I are willing to host you any time, day or night. She grinned at that. Well, I do want to see the valley you keep talking about. And the valley girls. I wonder how my sisters would react if you called them that. No idea, but I have this weird feeling we're going to find out. He laughed. Probably. He covered her hand with his, looking into her eyes. I really don't want our relationship to be over before it starts. I think we can work it out. I hope so, she said softly. It was then she realized that he already held her heart in the palm of his hand. If only he had been there three years before. Before she'd started her dance studio. When she'd been at a crossroads, trying to decide what to do. Before. He leaned over and brushed his lips across hers. I think you're pretty special, Heather McLean. She studied him for a moment, mesmerized by the pretty blue hue covering his face. Do you believe in the supernatural? You mean like Twilight Zone stuff? Sort of, she hadn't talked to anyone about her seeing the colors on people, but for some reason she wanted, no, she needed to tell him. About six months ago, I started seeing strange hues on people. Like their faces were weird colors. Okay. And I realized that if two people get close to each other, their hues will blend. Sometimes they change to a lilac color, which means they belong together, or a black color, which means they do not belong together, or something in between, meaning they're neutral together. She rushed through her explanation, looking only at her hands, and then she looked up at him, wondering if he'd think she was insane. That's odd. It never happened before that? She shook her head. There was a power outage at my parents' house when Dad was showing us some weird gadgets. It's been happening ever since. He frowned. What do your parents say about it? I haven't told anyone but you. 
he shrugged. It doesn't bother me if that's what you're trying to find out. All the twins in my family have magic powers. You have lots of twins? He nodded. We tend to. And all of them have weirdness going on. I'm not a twin, so I don't have it, but my mother is. She told me before I left Idaho that this trip would make me either the happiest man alive or the saddest. She said to fight for what I needed. Really? She was surprised, but not terribly. The youngest of the seven sons always had powers in her family. Why not his, too? She wondered if other families had those secrets they never told. Really? What color is our hue together? Michael asked. He knew she'd have the answer, and he suspected he knew what it was. No wonder this was so hard for her. Lilac. Your hue is a beautiful shade of blue. I noticed your hue before I noticed you, and I was so drawn to it. So that means we need to marry, right? She sighed. It means we are very compatible. I don't know if there can be more than one person with a hue that matches another. You haven't seen that? She shook her head. I don't know that I believe there's one soulmate for everyone either. I mean, what would happen if you were married to someone else when you met your soulmate? How heart-wrenching that would be. Now I want to go for a long walk with you and ask you about the hues of everyone we see. Can you see it on television? And in pictures? She shrugged. I couldn't until a few days ago. Now, I can. I don't know why or how it changed, but it's weird. Do you have any idea how badly I want to take you to the airport? He asked. Heather frowned at him. Why do you want to take me to the airport? That makes no sense. Because of all the people who are reuniting after time apart. I love watching people at gates of airports. They run into others' arms, and there's so much kissing. It's weird, but it's like the place to watch for people. She grinned. That could be fun. Figure out who really belongs together and who shouldn't be together. We could go around offering free relationship advice, telling people they should break up with their significant other or they should be with them forever. He laughed. I can picture doing that. I wonder if going to the movies would have the same effect. Is there a theater in town? Heather grinned as she understood. We can sit in the back row and check the others out. She went to pick up her paper. Let me see what's playing, 